I work for USID, uh, Afia Ugavi Project. I'm the chief of party and uh, I am a pharmacist uh, specialized in um, humanitarian and health supply chains. Let's go to the first line and to define what is emergency. So I said I'll be talking about emergency, emergency supply chain preparedness. So then we need to begin by uh, defining that. What is this emergency supply chain preparedness? And you can see from there is uh, you need to establish a system ahead of an emergency to manage all the commodities necessary to respond to an outbreak and ensure they get to the point of care as efficiently as possible. So preparedness is what you do before an emergency strikes. Sometimes you may not have an idea of what kind of emergency will come in. Like COVID gave us a challenge. It was new. It has not been seen before. And it came uh, in a way that shocked all systems. Not only locally, but globally. Now, uh, so then we want to ask ourselves as pharmacists or as logisticians, supply chain people, why does it, uh, why is it important? Why is emergency supply chain important? Number one, we are seeing emergencies present unique supply chain challenges. And I'll be talking about those three challenges. This was from a research done by UNICEF, I think in 2015, where they said during emergencies, the demand is unpredictable, number one, and it requires timely delivery to save lives. We can all relate to that. Demand is unpredictable. You don't know how much is required, isn't it? And you have to get uh, those uh, commodities to the front line uh, at the earliest opportunity possible. Cholera kills very fast. If there's an outbreak of cholera, you need to be able to intervene within the shortest time possible. You cannot wait to plan a lot of things because you are going to lose lives. Ebola and many other Now, emergencies again come out of emergencies. So, they put a strain on the system because you are not anticipating them. Your logistic system was designed to move um, 100 pallets per week. Now here the demand is a thousand pallets per week. Uh, your production unit, uh, those who are future in Kenya, there's the, there's the time you have to wait uh, before you can finish the production. I mean, the, you can release the commodities. Now you can imagine you have been releasing, let's say, um, 100,000 bottles, and now here the demand is 500,000. What do you do? You see the strain on the system. And then it requires resources to respond to emergency. I mean, the required resources are complex and expensive. Many are expensive because uh, you are dealing with a crisis and everyone is taking advantage. You all know what happened. We were buying gloves at how, many, how much? Ten times what we buy today. All the supplies were inflated in terms of cost and you can all relate to that. That's why I thought that we could talk about this so that we begin to... to uh, to look back in retrospect and see what we could have done differently. <clears throat> but then we are saying investment in preparedness pays off. When you prepare, uh, you are able to save lives because you are able to uh, move those commodities and get them uh, to the front line uh, rapidly. You are prepared. So when an emergency strikes, what do you do? You are able to move things quickly. Number two, uh, the money you invest in, in preparedness reduces the amount of response funds. You spend much less because you are prepared, you had, you had already negotiated prices, you had organized for your logistics, you had um, some contract in place, more contract or other kind of contract, and therefore the suppliers uh, know you had already agreed with them how much they would charge you. So because the emergency has come in, you will not be forced to pay um, exorbitant uh, prices. And then we are saying time invested in preparedness means response by over a week on average. That is what this research showed, that you are able to respond much faster because you and invested in preparedness. Let's move to the next slide and see then what are we talking about. So an emergency supply chain, again, we are saying is organized around three components. And I, in the morning, I had some of you alluding to some of these components. So we are talking about the people and the processes. We are talking about commodity planning, transport, and logistics. Those are the key, um, key 
key components that you need to uh, consider when you are designing your emergency uh, supply chain strategy. And um, perhaps I should mention that I understand the government of Kenya is very keen on this. And next week, I think that's when they begin the journey to develop uh, the national uh, emergency supply chain strategy. So uh, I think this is uh, really informed by the challenges we have faced. Now, under people and the processes, uh, we are looking at what structures, what do you need to have in place so that the emergency supply chain uh, can function? And here we will be talking about governance and organization structure, who is involved in the leadership, uh, issues of money, uh, what systems are there, have you identified the stakeholders, have you mapped the stakeholders? So that you know in the event of an emergency, who do you reach out to? Where will the money come from? Who are the people who will coordinate this response? So those are important considerations under people and processes. Then the issue of financing, I think I mentioned, you need to be able to anticipate uh, how much money will be required. And where will this money come from? Remember, you are planning and you don't know when this emergency will come. We are told that uh, the next emergency um, is likely to be bigger than COVID. But we don't know what shape it will take. So how do we prepare for that from a supply chain point of view, assuming it will be a medical issue? Then uh, you need also to know the triggers. What are the thresholds? At what point do you uh, recognize something as an emergency uh, threat? For example, how many patients should, do you need to see uh, of cholera so that you can say now here yeah, we have a, a problem and we need to begin preparedness. Uh, if it is Ebola, do you need to see a patient before you begin your emergency preparedness? Or in day when we were told that there's Ebola in Uganda, I can see, I saw the Minister of Health mobilizing. Isn't it? They mobilized, they made sure that uh, we are already in the event that it happens to us. And I remember also when we heard about COVID, I think uh, we were also prepared, but I think the actual preparations, actual, the action happened when I think we reported our first case. Now, when all this is done, then what you should be able to see is a clear governance and the processes to run the emergency supply chain. It should be very clear. The second thing is commodity planning. Remember here, you are talking about people and the processes. Now we are going to the commodity planning. Because those are the, that is what we use. That is, those are our tools of trade. That is what we use to intervene. So the question here is, what commodities will the emergency supply chain be responsible for and how will it uh, handle them, isn't it? So you begin by doing a forecast. The reason I wasn't able to join you yesterday is because we are doing a forecast for uh, HIV commodities. So I couldn't be here. Now, that is what we know. We are able to project the demand based on either morbidity, we have the patient numbers, and then uh, we can look at the percentage scale up that we are looking at. We, we, we need to consider. But I want you to imagine an emergency that you don't know the shape it will take. So how do you begin to do the forecast? What do you consider? You have to really think in a different way because you have to imagine a lot of things and say, uh, here you have either to use extrapolate, isn't it, from uh, similar conditions. For example, if we talk about anthrax, uh, you need to be able to know as a pharmacist what commodities are required, what kind of personnel is required, what we need to mobilize, uh, what must be put in place. And then you begin to imagine if we have, for example, 10 patients with anthrax, how do we deal with that matter? And remember, when it comes to anthrax, you are not only dealing with people. There is also the aspect of animals. So how do you collaborate with other uh, line ministries, other stakeholders, so that you are prepared? So, so if you have, you know the requirements for 10, then you imagine what would happen if we have 100, uh, we have 1,000 people that way. That's a simple way of looking at it, isn't it? Just like we do forecast for vaccines. A new vaccine, how do you uh, do a forecast for the requirements across the whole group? You have to make a lot of assumptions. And remember, if you get it wrong, either you lose pain, you patients die, or we have too much, and therefore we lose it. 
like we did with COVID vaccine, isn't it? You all know that we've got more than we can consume. Yeah. Then the issues of procurement and sourcing. Uh, what procurement protocols do you need to put in place it will supply you where will it come from? I'm giving you just the principles to consider because you will all be involved in this moving forward. Nobody has a choice, especially those of you working in the public sector. Remember the other day, you were told to quickly uh, support Sudan. The other day, I think Somali. And uh, you can imagine if uh, what happened in Turkey were to happen anywhere around here. We are the big brothers in the region. We will be called upon to give in our support, isn't it? So we all have to be prepared for that. Then the issue of uh, prepositioning. Where do you keep those inventory? When you talk about stockpiling, a very delicate issue because if you stockpile, you don't do the right rotation, you end up losing these commodities. That is money lost, isn't it? If you don't stockpile, there is an emergency that you need to respond to, then it will take much longer and it will be more costly for you to intervene. So how do you strike that balance? Because if you take action, you're damned. If you don't, you're damned. So how do you then strike that delicate balance? That is what we need to be thinking about moving forward. And the issues of transport and logistics, you are mainly asking yourself, how will these commodities get to where they are, where they are supposed to go? Who will be our transporters? There you have to look at the capacity. If we are moving, for example, a thousand pallets of a certain commodity, Let's say infusions. What kind of transport do you need? Who is going to provide that transport? And what arrangement do you have to put in place in advance so that in the event that we require those people to do uh, the transportation, they are able to uh, come in quickly, we call them. For example, you talk to Red Cross, you find out their capacity. You talk to the military, what is their capacity? And you talk to any other uh, person or uh, organization that provides such uh, services. So it's very important to be able to think in that direction. If you have to bring in uh, commodities, for example, uh, during COVID, where do you ha warehouse them? How do you store them? Where are the vaccines stored today? Those ones which have not, not used. Yeah, they are taking up all the space in the counties eh? and sub counties so that's a big issue we brought in gloves taking a lot of space maybe also in some of the central medical stores we know what is going on there then the other aspects i've talked about transport i've also talked about waste management if it's an infectious disease you have to think about where do you do the waste management do you carry all the waste from bungoma to nairobi or do you do you identify suitable uh, waste disposal uh, institutions over there. What would you do with, the, for example, um, infectious Azanda's waste that is in uh, Kisumu? Would you bring it to Nairobi? I also want to ask you another question. Uh, we have never destroyed COVID waste in this country. And the question that we are asking ourselves now is, what would be the best way to destroy the expired vaccines? Do you burn them? Do you incinerate them? Will they explode when you put them in the incinerator? Uh, are they likely to spill to the environment? So those are things we all need to think about. And that is a real question, especially for those of you in the, who are involved. Eh? That's a real question. Because uh, I think Kemuri also doesn't have that answer. Nobody knows how they will behave when they are put in the incinerator. Is there an, a risk to the environment? Again, those are things we need to think about. Then the issue of data. Remember, you have to account for everything. You have to account for everything that you bought. You have to account for everything that you destroy, including the waste. Isn't it? What has not been used, you must account for it. So data, and then also being able to see through the system, end-to-end -end visibility, which you were talking about here earlier, and that we need such systems to be in place. Uh, yeah, we can go to the next. So, let's then look at some 
of uh, uh, outbreaks and the potential implications. Uh, let's look at something that is localized, localized outbreak. Uh, here we are talking about an outbreak that starts and is contained within national borders. A good example there would be like anthrax, isn't it? Or cholera. So, what does that mean? It means then in terms of what you need to do at the country level for you as the supply chain, emergency supply chain officer, you need to think about, I mean, the first thing is coordinate with international partners. It's always going to involve the international partners. They are the big brothers. They have the money. They come in and help. Uh, get the expert advice, for example, WHO. Uh, perhaps use WHO uh, forecasting uh, tools to be able to determine what will be the actual uh, demand for commodities to intervene. And then uh, make use of regional stockpiles of commodities. Maybe Uganda might be having some commodities, Rwanda and that. And so uh, in a situation like that, we can quickly go there and tell them we have a challenge. Our capacity to produce infusions in Kenya is limited. Can we get some help from, the, from you? But then let's look at if this is regional outbreak. Uh, this starts in a neighboring country and it gets into your country. For example, Ebola, isn't it? Ebola fits in here very well. So if it has not crossed into your country, again, you do, you monitor progression of the disease and prepare for emergency, uh, I mean, uh, supply chains, even if the disease has not entered your border. The moment it enters, it is too late. You are going to pay 10 times for everything you buy. And there will be no people to, I mean, people, I mean, there will be no resources. You don't have any money because you didn't prepare. Then you have to coordinate with the neighboring countries and international organizations. Remember here we are talking about supply chain issues. And you all know what happened in 2020. But now the big one is this, a widespread pandemic. An example is COVID, isn't it? We have never witnessed this, we had never witnessed this before 2020. So here it's widespread pandemic affecting multiple regions of the world. Now, here is where the problem comes in. Because everyone you talk to cannot listen to you. The whole global supply chains are overstretched. And we saw this. So whatever what we were calling was vaccine, was it discrimination or something like that? Apartheid? Remember such a thing? Yeah, because nobody wants to release what they have. Their systems are strained. Nobody even wants to give you money because they don't know how this is going to, to evolve. So uh, in a situation like that, then uh, it becomes very complicated. And I think the only solution is to be innovative, like we did, and start preparing, uh, <coughs> manufacturing our own what? Masks, isn't it? Yeah. So that is just an example of how you need to think in terms of different levels of emergencies. Now here we have been talking about infectious disease outbreaks, but there are other conditions that may require emergency preparedness. Assume what happened in Turkey and happened in Kenya. How would we have dealt with it? The earthquake. So many people died. Uh, remember 1994. Those of you who are in Nairobi. Who knows what happened in 1994? El Nino, remember? Was it 90? I think it was 94. When people, it's not, it was 90 what? 90, yeah, no, that was post-election. Okay. <laughs> yes. You all know what happened. Those of you who are in Nairobi, you witnessed how many people died. A vehicle would be crossing like in the Nairobi River and you see it being swept away. And people are there, they die. So how then do you prepare? So it's not only for infectious diseases. It is for anything. Even war, like what is happening in Somalia. And in many other countries, isn't it? So we really have to prepare. So let's go to the next slide as I come to the end. Now, this is again uh, best practice in communication and coordination during emergencies. How do you do this? How do you do the communication? How do you do the coordination? And I think this is more or less my last trend. What do you need to do pre-emergency preparedness? You have to map all stakeholders and define their roles. Who will do what? 
Remember, this is not just a function of the Minister of Health. You have to involve the interior because of security issues. You have to involve the military. You have to involve uh, livestock. It, it's called Ministry of Agriculture nowadays because some of the diseases could be zoonotic. Maybe the problem is there's anthrax. So how you can't deal with it as the Minister of Health alone. So you map all those, know who will do what, then collect and distribute contact information. This is what you need to do before the emergency strikes. You need to know uh, who are the stakeholders, uh, including uh, international partners and document. And I'm hoping this is what the Minister of Health is going to do next week and moving forward. Then you have to hold monthly coordination meetings with the government, uh, managers and international partners. Now this is very easy. We do most of these things online. Then you set up a list of staff. It can either be a SMS, email, or WhatsApp. So that you can quickly contact the people you need to contact. And then coordinate to manage the stockpiles. Remember we talked about stockpiles? Very important. Now then what happens when the emergency strikes? During the emergency? Again, you have to contact all those people you said you list them as your stakeholders. You hold daily meetings. Remember, we used to have daily briefings during the peak, when COVID was at peak. And then, uh, of course, I'm expecting there's an emergency operation center, the command center. And then uh, you have to communicate clearly and often and uncertainty. You are communicating. There's a lot of uncertainty. You don't know how these things will go. You don't know the demand tomorrow. You don't know how many people are dying. And you don't know what you have because it's running out very fast. So you cannot focus. What you thought is uh, inventory to take you two weeks, now because of the, the escalation of the problem, you can only use it for two days. You see the uncertainty? Then effectively manage asymmetric information by actively sharing with all partners. Be very open. And finally, uh, you have to now to respond under a lot of pressure. Politicians are there. Their people are dying. And the media is there. They want you to tell them. What are your plans? What are you doing to manage this? Did we do this in March 2020? 2020? Did we do this? How did we um, respond to COVID? Um, let me tell you. In 2020, Kenya was the second country to have prepared this. The Rosalind here is here. She was my. I worked with Rosalind to prepare this for Kenya. Rosalind, should you stand up so that people know you are one of the people contributing to this? Rosalind Kirika. <laughs> we put this together in 2019. And the whole world was interested in knowing what Kenya is doing. So we moved from a joint external evaluation score of one, where there was nothing in place, and to three meaning we end preparedness in place. I remember we even went to the World Health Assembly to say what Kenya is doing. We shared with the people there what we are doing because I think we are the second country to do this. Uh, but come 2020, COVID kicked in. The first two weeks, what I've shared with you was used because we even have it in Excel, we have everything in day. We had done simulations involving all the stakeholders from all the ministries, including Interior. And uh, the first three weeks, they used to this. But after that, you know, uh, I think we went back to empirical response. And we did what we did, and we got in the trouble we got into. But Kenya somehow survived it. And we want to believe maybe this helped. Ladies and gentlemen, that's what I wanted to share with you. I will take any questions, but we didn't need to be prepared. Thank you very much.